Hi everyone, welcome back to the introduction to genomics lecture series. This time we will be talking about haplotypes and imputation. Before we move to the new material, so here is the quick summary from the previous lectures. So we talked about SNP markers that are widely used. There is a number of ways how to express these genotypes, but we are always talking about biallelic SNPs. And these biallelic SNPs are being genotyped with the species-specific SNP chips. We talked about how to determine the positions on the genome, and we talked about fiscal maps, and also we talked about recombination events that are of major biological importance, and they introduce variability to the populations. This graph is also from the last time, so we have an individual here, and there is a recombination event, and the previous capital A, capital B, and capital C haplotype is changing to capital A, lowercase b, and lowercase c haplotype because of this recombination event. During this lecture, we will look a bit more closely to these haplotypes and also show how to use them or what are, is the use for them in the context of genotype imputation. So when we look at the genotypes, what we see in reality is paternal and maternal chromosomes together that are joined during the fertilization to the set of alleles. So we, what we see are certain genotypes at certain loci. For the sake of example, let's say that we have these four individuals and at four loci we have these genotypes. What we see here are summaries only. Now, of course, we can ask the question, what are the actual sets of alleles on each chromosome? For the first individual, it is easy because its genotype consists entirely of homozygotes. So basically A, A, B, B, and C, C. So we know that on both chromosomes are actually the very same haplotypes of capital A, lowercase b, and the capital C. In the second individual, we have one heterozygote already. So while here is also just actually one option how to divide the haplotypes, the actual haplotypes on both chromosomes are different from each other. Because on one chromosome there is uh, capital A, capital B, and lowercase c, and the other chromosome has the lowercase a, capital B, and lowercase c. So basically one of each of these alleles goes into one chromosome and the other to the other chromosome. Of course, it becomes more interesting the more heterozygotes we have on our genome because this actually creates options how the haplotypes could be distributed. So we have the three loci here and two of them are heterozygotes, so the locus B and C. So if we look at the pairwise combinations of these alleles, then we could arrive to actually two solutions, either this one or, or this one. If you look at the alleles in these haplotype pairs, then the genotypes will end up always with this summary genotype. But also if you look carefully, the haplotype pairs, so the first two haplotype pairs are different from the second two haplotype pairs. Of course, the more heterozygotes we have, the more complicated it gets. So for example, for the three heterozygotes, we have even more combinations. So I put question marks here. So if you want, you can work this one out yourself. So just pause the video here and try to work out what are the actual haplotype possibilities in case that we have three heterozygous loci. So what are the haplotype combinations that are possible that end up with this summary genotypes. After you've done it, you can unpause the video and see if you were right, or just continue watching and get the answer in three, two, one, go. So these are the actual possibilities. So you see that there are actually four haplotype pairs that are possible based on these three heterozygous genotypes, and each of these haplotype pairs is different from one another. So basically how you solve this, so the first you take the first from each pair, so capital A, capital B, capital C, and then remains lowercase a, lowercase b, lowercase c, so this would be the 
the first one. Then you go with the pairwise combinations. You so you flip one locus at the time until you get to all combinations. Of course, we have many more than just three heterozygotes on the genome. So there is a question how we solve these questions in practice, where we have tens of thousands of loci and also thousands of heterozygous genotypes. Now the answer is, of course, with computers. Fortunately, there is sophisticated software that solves these questions for us and delivers the hypothesis we could analyze further. This computation process is called phasing. So the phasing is a task or the process in the computer to assign alleles to the paternal and maternal chromosomes. It looks for haplotypes or the so-called phases in large-scale genotype data and solve these complex problems of assigning correct haplotypes. Of course, this is easier if the so-called trios are genotypes, so they basically the sire, them, and the offspring, or in case of humans, the father, mother, and their child, or even if we have multi-generational trios that enter families, including grandparent and grand-grandparents are genotyped. So if everyone is genotyped, this process is somewhat easier. In reality, however, we don't have this ideal situation. Many times only parts of the populations are genotyped, so it is harder to work out the actual haplotypes. Fortunately, this is also possible, and haplotypes could be determined also for samples of unrelated individuals for a population. Unrelated here is in, in a quotation marks because there is usually some kind of relationship between the individuals within a population. So as I mentioned before, there are specific software solutions for all of this, which actually divide the genotypes to smaller segments and try to derive these haplotypes from these smaller segments and merge them back properly. Now, when we determine these haplotypes or these phases in a population, these are really useful for a number of purposes. And one of these purposes is the so-called genotype imputation. I mentioned multiple times that the SNP genotyping is fairly reliable, but occasionally we see missing genotype. So actually with this genotype imputation process, we can make an educated guess how to fill in these missing genotypes so we get the full information. So the imputation process is nothing else than filling in missing information. There are two major ways how we can use this method. The first one is the imputation of sporadically missing SNPs, and the other one is imputation between SNP chips. For example, we can extend a lower density SNP chip, for example, a 50K SNP chip to a higher density. For both of these approaches, I will give examples in the following slides. Out of the two methods, the imputation of sporadically missing SNPs is more straightforward. So as we established, some of the SNPs could be missing due to genotyping error. And because of these genotyping errors, we might be forced to remove individuals from our analysis. Or for example, if we need complete data in a sense that all SNPs should be known, then this is also a problem for us. But this situation could be fixed by imputing these sporadically missing SNPs. Let's say that we have an established haplotype in a population that looks like this. And uh, when we have an another animal or individual that is genotype, and there is a genotyping error, but the haplotype looks like this. So it's basically totally the same as before. So all the other loci for this haplotype are exactly matching, but these genotypes are missing. Based on this comparison, if every other SNP fits, we have a very good idea what should be filled in in the place of the question marks, so we have a complete data also for this individual. The imputation between SNP chips works on a similar logic, but it's somewhat more complex. So let's say we have a SNP chips of two densities, and this is a smaller example. So you see that there are 
16 columns here. So this will be our larger SNP chip. And the second SNP chip would be a smaller one that consists of eight SNPs. So each line here would be an individual, each column would be a locus, and uh, these loci are either homozygous one, so that is a zero, uh, heterozygous, that is a one, and the homozygous other, that is a two. Now the usual arrangement with these smaller and larger SNP chips, so that contain more or less SNPs, is that one SNP chip or the smaller SNP chip is a subset of the bigger one. So basically all the SNPs from the smaller SNP chip appear on the bigger ones as well, but there are other SNPs that are on the larger SNP chip, but unknown for the smaller one. So this shows the starting situation here when we genotyped nine individuals with the smaller SNP chip. Now let's say that these individuals are from a population that are fairly unrelated, but we also know that even in unrelated individuals, there are short stretches of sequences that are identical by descent. These local patterns of IBD or identical by descent could be described, and also the length of these segments determined, which of course varies based on the recombinations. If we identify these segments or these haplotypes, we can use them to our advantage. So for example, these would be the haplotypes that occur in our population. And also for the sake of this example, these are also color coded. So if we return to our original example for the nine individuals that are genotyped with the lower density SNP chip, so we could see that each of these individuals could be described as a combination of certain haplotypes. And because these haplotypes are already known, so we actually know what we should put into the place of the question marks. And this is then also done. And the information is being filled in to these gaps that were previously unknown. So what we basically do is we take the information from the higher density SNP chips, make the haplotypes for the population, and we use the information from these haplotypes to fill in the information also for the other individuals that were genotyped with a lower density SNP chip. In case this lower density SNP chip is a subset of the higher density SNP chip. Here, I would also underline that these haplotypes are, well, do not come from nothing, but actually we need a sufficient number of individuals that are actually genotyped with this higher density SNP chip in this population. So we can determine the actual haplotypes that occur in this population, which can be further used for this genomic imputation as described here. Now, why is this useful? Well, the lower density SNP chips tend to cost less. So if genotyping costs is an issue or we want to genotype a really a large number of individuals, we can use, well, just this lower density SNP chip and go for the imputation process. Of course, for this, we need haplotypes that were determined based on individuals genotyped by the high density SNP chip. This imputation is a so-called in silico. So basically it's done with computers, which also means that it is with no additional costs other than the computation cost for the whole process. There are different options and possibilities for software for this process. And to my knowledge, all or most of them are also free or open access. Based on this software, we can do the imputation that will be done with a certain accuracy. So actually the whole process is not 100% accurate, but actually works surprisingly well. The imputation accuracy in general depends on the size of the reference set and the data quality. What I mean with this is that we need to determine actually the haplotypes that occur in this population or the population of interest. So of course we need to have a representative sample genotype with the higher density SNP chips in order to determine the haplotypes that occur in the population so we could use these haplotypes further on in the imputation process. 
In general, the imputation works really well for the common SNPs, which occur reasonably frequently within a population. This also means that, unfortunately, the imputation works less well for the so-called rare SNPs, so that occur very infrequently because there is just no way for the imputation process to pick it up from the haplotypes that are available for these populations. So the general advice is that if someone is interested in a very specific rare alleles, then the imputation process is perhaps not the best solution. In that case, genotyping the individuals with the actual higher density SNP chip is advisable. But overall, the imputation works really well. So I put there that the imputation accuracy could be more or is more than 95%. So I just put their numbers so you have a, a bit of an idea that we are talking about very high values. Actually, uh, especially in the simulation studies, uh, well, in my experience is the imputation accuracy is lower than 99% and the people start to get unhappy. So it's uh, actually in the papers, especially in simulations, the imputation accuracy is much higher than 95%. In real data, well, it could be variable. As I mentioned, this really depends on the reference and the data quality. Also, there is a range of possibilities how to evaluate the actual imputation accuracy, but it is mostly done in, with the so-called masking procedure. So it's a very similar process that I described also in this presentation. So there are the genotypes obtained from a higher density SNP chip. And basically within this process, some of these genotypes are deleted. And then the imputation software is used to fill these missing markers in. But of course, we know what is the actual genotype for this higher density SNP chip. So then basically the values that were filled in by the software and those that are, were obtained from the actual genotyping are compared. And this is the basis how actually the imputation software is also being evaluated, how good of a job it does. But as I mentioned, this software do a surprisingly good job. And we already arrived to the end of this segment and we end as always with a short summary. We talked about uh, the so-called haplotypes that are a series of SNPs and these haplotypes clarify which combination of alleles come from which parent. Of course, if we want to do these computations on the large scale or in real genotypes, we need to use computers for it. And there is a range of specialized software programs that does the job for us. And the approach itself is called phasing. And these phases or haplotypes could be used in a various ways, but one of the uses is the so-called imputation process, which is nothing else than filling in the missing SNPs to our data. Here we also have options if we want to fill in sporadically missing SNPs that were not genotyped for some reason. So some kind of genotyping errors or missing SNPs could be filled in or imputed. Or we have a different option when we can actually extend smaller SNP chip to a larger one based on haplotypes and information from this larger and denser SNP chips perhaps even saving some money in the process because these lower density SNP chips tend to cost less. And if we are not interested in some very specific rare alleles and we are fine with the imputed version of these genotypes, we can use these for our research. So we end here today. Let me know if you have any questions or comments down in the comment section below. Also, thank you for your time you spent on this video and I wish you a very nice day.